Good morning. This morning I'm going to be talking about dealing with the claims of creditors who have or claim to have retention of title. This is a, a summary of the points I'm going to be talking about. I'll start with a, a quick recap to remind us how retention of title works, uh, what the default setting is, um, what the law says about the passing of title in the sale of goods when nothing else is agreed between the buyer and the seller. I'll be looking at how contractual terms are incorporated into the contract, which is very often the key point in assessing uh, an ROT claim. I'll show you a simple clause to show what it looks like, and then I'll talk a little bit about what you might see in advanced clauses. And I'll finish the recap by then talking about, very briefly, administrations, um, the moratorium ring fence and how that applies um, with the Atlantic computers rules. And then once I've finished the recap, I'll then move on to demonstrate the guided assistance tool that we've got uh, on our website that I hope you'll find useful. So let's start now by looking at how retention of title works. I mean, it is primarily a credit control tool. It is used by businesses that sell goods to try and reduce the risk of bad debts. And the way it works is that the supplier keeps the ownership of the goods that they sell um, until they've been paid for, even, even when those goods have been delivered and are in the hands of their buyer. This is the significance of that. Because the seller is still the owner of the goods, they have the right to repossess them. Um, and that means that if the buyer doesn't pay them, um, they have got the right to take their goods back. Um, they're often reluctant to do that because, of course, what they really want is to be paid their debt. Um, but if they can't be paid, they can at least take their goods back. And that does give them some leverage um, in perhaps negotiating uh, more payment, uh, higher payment than they would otherwise receive in an insolvency. So I'll move on from there to look at the default setting. And this is the way that the law says that ownership of goods passes when they are sold, um, if nothing else is agreed. The rules are contained in the 1979 Sale of Goods Act. Um, and there are a number of rules that apply in different circumstances. What they boil down to is this. Um, unless something else is agreed between the buyer and the seller, then by the time the buyer receives the goods, they will already be the buyer's property. So the, the seller will lose the ownership of their goods um, probably before they are even delivered to their customer. And that default setting, um, of course, puts the seller at risk because it doesn't give them the credit control terms that ideally they would like. So many businesses supplying goods uh, ask their customers to agree something different, which they very often do by having printed terms of business that include, among other clauses, a retention of title clause. Now, whether those printed terms actually work or not will depend um, on whether their customer has actually agreed to those terms. And if they have been agreed, they form part of the contract between the buyer and the seller. But if those printed terms are not agreed by the customer, that means that the rules set in the Sale of Goods Act for the passing of ownership will apply. And those default rules mean that the goods will belong to the customer once they are in the customer's hands, probably earlier than that. Now, these sorts of standard terms, the small print standard terms printed on the back of invoices, um, um, tucked away on the website somewhere, are often not discussed or agreed between buyer and seller. And in, in some cases, um, the buyer doesn't even see them at all. So the way that this is dealt with is that contract law has some established rules 
to set out when a contract is treated as having been made. And it is very artificial, but the essence of it is this, that you have to imagine that one party made a final offer in the negotiations, and then the other party then accepted it, and they effectively shook hands at that point. So the final offer was made, and there wasn't then a, a further negotiation, there wasn't a yes, but, um, I'd like these changes or um, yes but I'm not sure about part of it it is just yes okay uh, we'll go for that and then a, a handshake now negotiations are very often more complicated than that and not as clear-cut as that but nevertheless the legal analysis does require you to go back and identify who made the final offer that was then accepted to make the contract and it is the acceptance of that final offer that makes the contract um, and because there is no disagreement at that point as to what the offer is um, then the terms of the offer will be the terms of the contract and this means the trick for the seller is to make sure that their standard terms their printed terms are part of the offer that's being made. If they can show that they've done that, then the law will have to assume that the buyer accepted those terms um, exactly as written, and that those terms exactly as written are terms of the contract. And what this boils down to is that um, sellers who are careful and sensible about the way that they do business, will want a retention of title clause in their printed terms, and they will want to follow a contracting procedure so that their documents, their paperwork, actually synchronizes with the way that they do business so that they can make sure that their customers are accepting those terms in this somewhat technical sense so that they form part of the contract. In terms of what a retention of title clause might say, um, it can be extremely simple, very straightforward. And the clause that says just this will work. If the, just, if the clause just says title in the goods does not pass to the buyer until they are paid for, then that will work as an effective, simple retention of title clause. It, it won't, however, give the seller of the goods the best protection that they could have. Um, hence, you will see a number of more advanced retention of title clauses being used. Um, and there are three here that I'll, I'll mention as being ones that you quite commonly see. The first one is an all monies clause. And this is where title is not retained on an invoice by invoice basis but it is retained across the whole trading account. So this is particularly effective where you've got um, a supplier who has a regular customer um, and they make regular deliveries to this customer. And the all monies clause will mean that as long as their customer owes them something, then none of the goods that have been delivered to their customer will belong to them. Um, there are uh, there have been arguments about whether a clause like that is effective or not. Um, if it's properly drafted, um, then yes, it will be effective. Um, so all monies clauses are very common, and say so they they do usually work when when drafted properly. Um, the second one that you sometimes see is a separate storage clause, which requires the buyer to segregate the goods that they have received from other similar goods um, and keep them separate so that uh, if the seller should need to repossess them, they'll be easy to find and easy to identify as having been supplied by the seller. Now, this clause is actually somewhat artificial um, because nobody ever expects it really to be enforced during the normal trading relationship. Um, 
it's, it's not something that suppliers regularly check up on, but it can be really useful if the goods have been mixed. So imagine that you've just been uh, appointed as liquidator of a company that had a delivery of heating oil to the factory just two weeks before you were appointed. Um, and you've now got the oil supplier is claiming retention of title. Now they will have poured that oil into a tank that was, well, it, perhaps not completely empty, that would already have had maybe, um, would already been say quarter full of oil. And it's going to be impossible for the supplier to separate out the oil that they have supplied from the oil that was already in the tank. If there is a separate storage clause, then they may not need to do that because the fact that the buyer is in breach of the terms of this agreement, which would have required them to have poured that oil into a separate empty tank so it was kept separate from the oil they'd already got. Because they're in breach of that, it, it means that the supplier is likely to be able to claim a proportionate part of the oil that is in that tank. So it does mean that they may be able to claim retention of title to some of the oil in that tank. Third example I will give is a proceeds of sale clause. And this is where the supplier knows that the goods that they are supplying will themselves be sold on by their customer to its own customers um, before they themselves get paid. And the purpose of this is to try and give the supplier um, an interest in the book debts that you are collecting on behalf of the company in liquidation. So proceeds of sale clause will be one where the retention of title supplier might say to you, look, not only do I want my goods back, but also where goods were sold pre-appointment, I want you to make sure that I get paid from those debts when you collect them. Now, I've seen quite a few proceeds of sale clauses in my time. I have yet to see one that works. And the usual reason why they don't work is because what they're doing is they're giving the supplier um, an interest in property that has been created by the company. Um, in other words, the debts that have been created. And the value of that claim is necessarily limited to the amount that they are owed. So essentially it's giving them a property interest in the, their customers' own property, its debtors, where that property interest is limited to the amount that is owed to them. Now that is essentially a charge. Um, and unless it's being registered at company's house as a charge, um, it won't be valid. Now I've seen a number of sophisticated arguments for proceeds of sale clauses. Um, so I've yet to see one that works. Um, and they're the sort of thing you might need to take advice on if you've got um, a supplier who is pursuing it aggressively. But the rule of thumb is, if they're claiming an interest in book debts, that's not going to work. The final thing I want to cover in this quick recap um, are the special rules that apply in administrations. Um, and of course, administration throws up this ring fence around the company's assets that includes goods that are in the company's possession, even if they don't own them. It includes goods over which suppliers are claiming retention of title. And the effect of the ring fence is that the supplier, even if they've got a good retention of title claim, they cannot uplift their goods unless they've got permission from you as the administrator or permission from the court. But um, this is intended to offer only temporary protection. It's intended to, um, to give you a bit of a breathing space um, when you're first appointed as administrator to get on with the primary job of saving the, the business. Um, 
it's not intended to change the fundamental nature of the relationship between the insolvent company and its suppliers. And what Atlantic Computer says, um, amongst many other things, in fact, I think I probably ought to cover Atlantic Computers in a bit more detail at a future session. Um, so do let me know if you'd be interested in that. But what Atlantic Computers does say, amongst other things, is that you have a duty as the administrator to assess the supplier's claim, to do so fairly and to do so quickly, to get on with it promptly. And if their claim is good, you should either allow them to take their goods back or if you need the goods for the purposes of the administration, then you should be paying for them. And in this context, um, I'll also remind you of the recent changes to the Insolvency Act um, around Section 233, where there's a new Section 233A and a 233B. Again, this might be a good topic for a, a future uh, coffee break briefing as well. But the, the new provisions, it, essentially the purpose behind them, the policy behind them, is to make it harder for suppliers to cut off the supply of goods and services to an insolvent company or to make ransom demands to, to put up the price or to insist that part of their historic debt is paid as a condition of making future supplies. Now, as uh, it'll usually be as administrator, but these do apply to all types of corporate insolvency procedure. Um, as administrator, you will have to pay for those supplies that they make after your appointment. Um, but it is a way of um, stopping the wheels from coming off in those cases where it can be useful. Right, um, moving on now to look at the guided assistance page on our website. Um, and I do hope you'll find this useful. Um, so I'll just click here to open up the website. I think I, I may need to um, to change the screen I'm sharing so that you can see that. So I hope this is it and I hope you can see that. Um, but here we go, this is this is our uh, retention of title assistant we're calling it, which is there to help you as an insolvency practitioner deal with retention of title claims. Um, I think the time when this would be most useful is when you've got um, a claim in front of you and it would make sense to get the paperwork together. So get the get the supplier to fill in the usual questionnaire. And once you've got that back with the supporting evidence, then you can go onto this website um, and have a look to see um, what the issues are likely to be. So I'll just take you through that. Um, and Let's, let's look at a hypothetical claim. Let's imagine that this is um, a case where you are not dependent upon this supplier for, the, um, for, for your strategy. So this is not a trading administration where you, you need supplies to continue. So, sorry, I clicked the wrong one there. So I should just go back. I should have clicked on no future supplies are not essential. Um, and we will assume that this supplier does have a retention of title clause, otherwise you'll get a very quick answer on this. Um, were any of the goods identifiable uh, as at the date that you were appointed? Um, let's assume for the purposes of this that the supplier has not yet um, turned up to the premises themselves to look at the stock that's there and identify um, what they've got. So we'll click on the unsure button there. And this is now suggesting that you'll probably want to note this down. So I'd suggest that you probably would want to print out this page at this stage. Um, and what the suggestion here is that you'll probably want to give the supplier the benefit of the doubt for now. Carry on looking at their questionnaire and their supporting papers to see whether this is a good claim. Um, and and if their claim is good, to invite them then to uh, attend on site to see if they can identify their goods. So we'll carry on from here. And this now um, goes into the questions that assess whether the 
supplier's terms have been incorporated into the contract. So we'll click through to that. And the next question is whether the contract was specifically negotiated between the supplier and the insolvent company. In this case, we'll say that no, it wasn't. We'll say that the supplier simply used their small print uh, on the back of their invoices and other documents. The next question is then asking whether the insolvent company itself used its own standard terms of purchase. Um, and this can be important because going back to the offer and acceptance analysis of when a contract is made, if you've got the insolvent company itself using standard terms of purchase and you've got a supplier using standard terms of sale, you've then got an immediate contradiction as to which side's standard terms will apply. Um, in this case, we'll keep it simple and we'll say that the, um, the insolvent company did not use its own standard terms of business. The next question that comes up is to, is to ask whether the insolvent company signed a credit account application form or something similar. And these have become increasingly common in recent years. And so let's say that in this case, yes, um, with the questionnaire that's been produced a copy of a signed credit account application form for this company. Um, you should look at the credit account application form to see if it refers to future suppliers being on the standard terms of business of the supplier. We'll assume that they got that right in this particular case. Um, and you should check to see whether um, the, uh, the form did refer to the retention of title clause or the document that incorporated um, um, a reference to the standard terms of business uh, in unambiguous terms, something like that to show that you can create a link between the signed credit account application form and the trading terms. Again, let's let's assume that, that they got this, this part of that right as well. And the next question is to ask you to check that it was the same retention of title clause. Um, I've sometimes seen different retention of title clauses printed on the credit account application form from the one that was printed on the invoice. Um, and that's, um, that's tremendously useful for uh, a lawyer who's trying to argue that the retention of title clause does not work. So in this case, we'll assume they got that right. And again, you get a, 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 an interim conclusion here that says, yes, it looks as if the supplier did manage to incorporate their retention of title clause. Um, so uh, at least some of the goods on site may well be covered by their claim. And again, it's saying you may want to keep a note of this for your file. So it would make sense to print this out as well as a, as a, a record of that sort of interim decision. Now we have to move on to see whether the clause actually worked to retain title or not. Next question is, is it professionally guided? Is, is it professionally drafted? And there's a, a link here to a page that will um, explain what we mean by that, um, uh, how you can make a quick assessment as to whether a lawyer has drafted this or, or whether it's something that's been cobbled together. It may be obvious, it may not be obvious. Let's assume from having seen this that this is a point that you're not sure of yourself at this point and you, you might want to go back and look at it a bit later. So we click on the unsure button and again we have another um, interim decision page coming up here that says that um, you'll probably want to note this down so again you'll probably want to print this page out um, and then once you've been through the rest of the questions um, if they indicate that on all of the other criteria that you're looking at the supplier is likely to have a decent case then it may be worth coming back um, to look at the clause in a bit more detail to see if it works the way that you you think it works um, and that at least will help to limit the question that you need to ask a lawyer because if you've been able to um, answer all of the other points to, to your own satisfaction other than this then it's a relatively quick question just to ask you know I think that they've got a good claim um, but it's going to depend upon whether this clause works can you tell me whether it does or doesn't so moving on from there 
Um, we've now got a few questions about what the contents of the clause are. So first question is, is the supplier asking for um, an interest in the proceeds of sale? Well, let's assume that they are. And here you just get a simple interim decision page saying you will probably want to reject that part of the, the claim. Um, and you'll still need to decide what to do with the rest of the supplier's claim. And as with the other pages like this, you may want to print this out so that you've got a record of it by the time you get to the end of uh, the, the analysis. So we'll move on from there. Next question is <clears throat> whether this is an all monies clause. And these are quite common. So we'll say that this is an all monies clause. And this then goes on to ask whether the balance on the trading account between the insolvent company and the supplier, whether that balance has dropped to zero at any point since the account was opened. And the relevance of that question is, of course, that when the account dropped to zero, that means that the company will have paid at that time all money that it then owed to the supplier. And that means that any goods that were in its stock from the supplier on that date, they will have become the insolvent company's property. So we'll say in this particular case that that has happened. Um, and again, we get another interim decision page here saying, in that case, you'll probably want to reject the claim for older goods because goods supplied before that date will now belong to the insolvent company. But that doesn't apply to goods that have been delivered under invoices issued since that date. Um, and again, there, you may want to keep a note of that, your file. Um, we will assume that uh, goods have not been mixed with those from another supplier. We'll assume that the goods have not been worked in any way. They've not been used in a manufacturing process. Um, and we'll assume that they uh, haven't been delivered to a building site. They've not been attached to a building. Um, and there's a, another question here about whether any of the goods have been sold on um, before your appointment. And this, it says here, this is only about goods still on the bust company's premises when you were appointed. So this might be a question about, say, industrial washing machines, where maybe you've got 30 in, in stock as at your appointment, but already 20 of those have been sold on to other customers and just waiting delivery. In this case, we'll keep it simple and we'll say that none have been sold on. Um, and this is now a summing up page to say, looking at all of the uh, interim decisions that have been flagged up on this, are you now able to decide that you can reject the supplier's claim for all of the goods that were still on site when you were appointed? And we'll say, in this case, no, we don't think we can. And this question then is moving on to ask whether this has been a trading appointment, whether you have yourself sold or used any of the goods since you were appointed. And uh, we'll keep it simple and say no here. And this now gets to the final decision page, um, which is where the suggestion is that you'll probably want to offer the lower of either the resale value of the goods, what they're actually now worth on the open market, or the supplier's price for them. So the um, item price multiplied by the number of items that you have on site, or if it's a lower figure, the actual debt that's owed to the supplier. Um, and this is, of course, colored by the previous decisions that you have made, um, which are that the supplier has not yet identified any of their goods on site, um, and you will now need to invite them to come and do so. Um, but you've got a question mark about whether the clause actually works or not, and you may want to ask a lawyer to review that for you. Um, they are claiming an interest in the proceeds of sale, which you are going to reject, um, and that the account had been at a zero balance um, at, a, at some date in the past. So you'll need to identify goods that were supplied before that date because if there are any of those still um, on site, then those will be the property of the insolvent company and not the supplier. So that's 
really how the flow charts works. There's this button here, which I won't click on, which says take legal advice, which as you'd expect, um, uh, gives me gives you my contact details. And then here, uh, you've got the option of starting the flow chart again. So if you've got three or four uh, retention of title claims to look at, um, you can print out this page with the ones you printed out earlier, stick that on the file for the first claim that you're dealing with, um, and then go back to the beginning and start again with the second one. Now, I'm just going to go back. If I can find the page for doing that. I'm just going to go back to the PowerPoint slides now. Um, and we'll just finish off from there. So we've been through the retention of title website. So that's that dealt with. And really, it's now just for me to ask if you've got any questions. Um, I don't see that any questions have come through, so unless there are any in the next minute or two, uh, I'll just remind you of some future dates for the diary. Um, next coffee break briefing on the subject, it's not fraud, um, will be on Monday the 13th of February. Um, uh, I'm going to be attending the R3 Southern and Thames Valley Forum in Reading on the 23rd and 24th of March, and hope to see a number of you at that as well. Um, and big date for your diary is our second annual insolvency conference is on the 12th of May, um, and we'll be uh, holding that here in Christchurch. Um, we've got a nice venue by the, the river, um, and I hope as many of you as possible will come along to that on that date. So that's it for this morning. Um, thank you very much indeed and see you again in a month's time, if not before. So thank you. Goodbye.